coming out. If you can't hear me, raise your hand. Can you hear me? We're in little intimate circumstances. Um, I want to thank um, WNYC Green Space for the opportunity to talk to the, today's great thinkers working in the poetic form. Oh, thank you. Um, I want to thank WNYC Green Space for the opportunity to talk about, uh, to talk to, rather, today's great thinkers working in the po po poetic form, whether they write lyrics, as in, as in the case of Michael R. Jackson, or verse, as in the case of Sha Shane McRae, one feels that so much of the more interesting discuss discussions about what makes us a nation and not are happening in shorter, more intense forms, forms that McRae and Jackson have mastered and will continue to master. And while um, McRae and Jackson speak from different vantage points in life, straight and gay, musical and not, I find that when I listen to their respective work, I am listening to different aspects of the black male experience, an experience that is not presented as all-encompassing, but particular to McRae and Jackson's visions, the intensity of their respective projects. Now, a few biographical notes. Shane was born in Portland, Oregon, and he attended Linfield College, Harvard University, the University of Iowa. He teaches at Columbia, Uni Columbia University School of the Arts, and his recent book, The Gilded Auction Block, just came out last year from Farrar, Stroud, and Giroux. He is also a, recip a recent recipient um, of the Guggenheim Fellowship. So the program tonight will be in two parts. Um, the first part will be me chatting with Shane and then followed by Michael. So let's work welcome Shane first, Shane McRae. Thank you. choreography together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, thank you very much. Um, Shane, I just, I, I wanted to sort of just jump in here because this book is so um, rich and your work is so varied. Um, I was interested in this while reading the, uh, the Gilded Auction Block and how you address certain poems to America, um, a very great undertaking. And you intersperse these lyrics with other kinds of poems um, about people of color who had a marginalized place in history and, and place. Sometimes those voices were in the first person, and that reminded me somewhat of um, an early enthousi enthusiasm for me was Edgar Lee Masters and mm. Carl Sandburg and writers like that, and other American writers who speak straight out of the voice of a, of a lived history. Um, so that's a very complicated but clever way to ask you, um, can you tell us something about your history and your growing up? Oh, shoot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, okay. Well, uh, I, um, I guess I spent, I say I grew up in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, I really lived there from uh, the age of three to the age of 10. And so that's not exactly growing up, but... It's formative. Yeah, that's where it feels like um, growing up ended for me. After I moved from uh, Texas, it was uh, Round Rock, Texas, a suburb of Austin. Um, I had my first like real significant existential crisis. And that was when I sort of decided um, that I, the way I think of it now is I sort of gave up on life because uh, I was really unpopular as a, as a little kid. And uh, when I moved from Texas to California when I was 10, what, I lost all my you, friends. Why do you think you were targeted? As the, uh, I mean, I, I was, I was one, there, were, there was one other black kid in the school. And mm -hmm. so I think that might have been part of it. Um, I think um, I was extremely eager um, and, uh, to, to have friends. That might have been part of it. And also, it um, seems like a small thing now, but it's a big deal when you're a kid. Um, I did not start at this particular school until uh, second grade. And so it mm. seemed like everybody else there had known each other from kindergarten, and I didn't have those important foundational memories. So I think those three things, maybe. And also, you know, me just generally not being very good socially, I suppose. Um. There, was, there were things that I've read um, in preparing and also while reading your poems about racial 
um, diversity in your in your family, mm-hmm. and also conflict. Um, can can you, would you mind talking about that? A, a sure. Bit? Uh, so uh, I was raised by uh, white supremacists, but um, sort of two different versions of them. They were um, they were my uh, grandparents, my mother's parents, and my grandfather. Um, was, and I guess still is, I mean, he's still alive as far as I know, was what one would just think of as a sort of straight up white supremacist, but not, I mean, he was very vocal and active about it. He wasn't, he didn't keep it hidden. And my grandmother was um, a Nazi sympathizer, but that is actually kind of a different thing in mm-hmm. practice. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, and that that had partly to do with a, um, a really distorted and exaggerated pride in her um Austrian heritage. Mm -hmm. Um, And so um, my mother, I think partly as an act of rebellion with regards to this stuff, um, had, um, she was, she had dated a a black man when she was a teenager. And that was um, where I came from Mm -hmm. uh, when when she was 18. And it was, uh, my grandparents sort of allowed me to shuttle between them until I was about three. And then... Um, Shuttle between your mother and them? Mother and uh, my father. Mm-hmm, I see. And um, then uh, when I was three, they took me to Texas and um, never told my father where I was. And so I didn't see him again until I, I found him when I was 16. Um, mm. And so it was, it was a, lot of, a lot of drama, I guess. And when you say th- um, that you found him... Mm-hmm. <clears throat> One of the things that is so striking to me and, and deeply moving about your story is how um, focused you've been on finding the things that were crucial to your understanding of the world, whether that be reading or or a parent. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's something very powerful about the idea of finding yourself through other people. And I think that poets find themselves in metaphor, yes? Yeah. And so what was powerful to you about reading and about your edu- self-education I should say uh, you know I at first I, I know think, it doesn't feel that way to you it just feels natural but no it it I mean in, in retrospect I mean I at first I I think it was just that I was getting a lot of positive feedback for writing poems I started when I was 15 and by that time I as I said I had my existential crisis when I was a little kid and I'd been failing grades from the sixth grade up and mm. so by the time I was 15 anytime anybody saw me interested in anything, they were very excited. Um, And so there was a lot of positive feedback for writing these very, very terrible poems that I wrote when I was uh, in high school. Who were your influences? Sylvia Plath. Mm -hmm. She was my only influence. (laughs) Um, uh, Sylvia Plath and and, and probably like The Cure. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That that was was what I was into. Um, And so, um, you know, it, it... I I didn't realize that at the time, but there was a lot of energy that I put into discovering my own things. You know, mm. um, I got very invested um, when when I was young and, and you know like twenty or so in reading like essentially the Western canon as I understood it. Mm-hmm. But I was you know living like I was living in a trailer. I dropped out of high school. I didn't know anybody who had any interest in any of these things. But uh, were you in Oregon by then? I was or? in Oregon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I was very interested in, the, in these things, and so I just was sort of, I was just consuming books. I was reading, for years, I was reading like 200 pages a day, every day. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just, I wanted to read everything. And uh, I didn't have anybody to tell me what to read, and so I would use other books to tell me what to read. Um, But it was a... Looking at the footnotes of bibliography. Looking at the footnotes and the bibliographies. And it was a time, I think, now I realize that that I put the most energy into figuring out who I was. and it was almost entirely on my own. Were you publishing anything at all then? Or? I mean, yeah. I mean, the first poem yeah, I published. It's okay. We won't. <laughs> we won't dig them up. Uh, yeah. But. I was. I was. I, I first published a poem when I was seventeen, and I published a few more when I was eighteen, nineteen, twenty. But they were. They were not. They weren't. They weren't good. But I was. Um, <clears throat> but you were going to be good at it. Well, you know, I for some reason I thought I would be good at it, um, and I certainly. I knew that there was nothing else I could conceivably be good at. Um, and mm. so, you know, I, at least there was that. It was, um, it was very interesting to read in your early work about the family structure and being sent 
back and forth. And um, for those who haven't read um, your early work, um, can we discuss that kind of schism and split for you mm. between um, your mother's family and your father? Um, what did you feel and what did you remember about that? Sure. Uh, well, it was uh, it was pretty strange, I suppose. Um, when I was uh, when I was living in Texas with my grandparents, they were very invested in so, me. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? That yeah. they have a black grandchild. Yeah, uh, oh. it, it's, <laughs> it's it's a sort of Spike Lee movie. It's it, it that is ha- waiting to be made. Yeah. Well, that's you know that's the book before this had. Um, the adopted um, yes. biracial child of uh, uh, the president of the Confederacy in it. Yes. So um, it was, um, it was, you know, they they were very invested in me not remembering clearly my infancy. Mm. And so, for example, I said that I was with my lived with my mother sometimes, and my father sometimes until I was three, and they convinced me that I was eighteen months when I was taken. I didn't know I was three until I was maybe in my thirties. Mm. Um, they told me that my father had never wanted me and that he had found, got, started a new family in Brazil. And I don't know why they chose Brazil. Um, I think Lots it was... Lots of Nazis l- ended up there. Maybe. Yeah. I think it was also just because it seemed so far away that there was no way I would ever embark upon a journey to Brazil. I'm not, you know. Right. Um, they didn't want me to have any sense of uh, my father's family at all. Um, and they didn't want me to even understand my own memories. Mm-hmm. And so it was, uh, they put a lot of effort into that. And so it was, it was a kind of schism, but it was really more like they just sort of obliterated um, all of that stuff. And because it, um, the sort of terrible thing that happens is that they obliterate oneself while they're trying to make another. Yeah. And one of the things that I find so beautiful about your writing and about your life is that there's this kind of quiet resistance always to, to the authoritative voice, the voice that says, um, you are this. Um, so much of your life as an artist and as a, as a man has been self-defining mm. um, and hard won. And I'm wondering now about um, this aspect um, that I brought up a little bit earlier about education, mm. um, because you started really sort of getting it yourself, a GED and accomplishing um, until you ended up at Harvard mm-hmm. um, at the law school. Can, can you talk about that? <laughs> sure. I won't call it journey because I hate that word, but yeah, no, how about I, your trip? Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I didn't start thinking about college until I was about 20 because um, I, had, I had dropped out and gotten my GED uh, when I was 18. Mm-hmm. Um, I started at community college for a few years. Um, Eventually ended up at Linfield College. Uh, was after, there a reason for Portland? Or? I mean, I was born in Portland, and um, my family was there, mm-hmm. and so I was there at the time. And Linfield was the only program anywhere near me that had a creative writing degree. Mm-hmm. Um, and so after Linfield, I went straight to the Writers' Workshop at Iowa. And um, I had been thinking all the way back at Linfield, though, that it was conceivable that someday I could go to law school just because um, I had a general idea of what the LSAT was like, um, and I have always really loved logic games, and the Mm. LSAT has a lot of logic games on it. And so I figured I would probably do well on it. And um, so I went to the writer's workshop. Um, I didn't really know what to do after that, and so uh, I said, I guess I'll go to law school. (laughs) Um, I, uh, I took the LSAT. Um, I did not, I I did not actually, um, apply to Harvard. Um, they called me weirdly and said, you should apply. And so I said, sure, that would be great. Um, and Yale called also, and I had already heard from Harvard and I thought for reasons that I still don't fully understand, I thought I was a Harvard person. Mm-hmm. And so I did not apply to Yale. <laughs> um, and so, so that's, there. so there, so yeah. that's how I ended up at, at Harvard law school. Um, what, I never, was it, what was it like for you to go from the trailer to the hallowed halls of, um, in Cambridge? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I had read about Harvard a lot cause a lot of really, um, a lot of poets that I loved, had, had gone there. Lowell and Bishop. Yeah, and, and yeah. Ashbury and all mm-hmm. them. And so I, I was aware of it. Um, I mean, you know, as a slightly less vague thing than, you know, Harvard. 
that sort of occupies sort of the general consciousness. Um, it, it was weird. I, I guess I had never met that many wealthy people before. Um, mm-hmm. and, I, and there were ways in which I didn't really understand uh, their worlds very well. But I ended up being friends um, with some tremendously wealthy people. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason was, I think ironically, because I didn't, I could not care less about their wealth. I had right. zero interest in it. I had this sort of anger in general about wealth. Mm-hmm. And I think that they liked that. Um, and so um, that was one of the <laughs> weirder aspects likes of it. Yeah, everybody <laughs> yeah. likes a little ideological spanky winky from some, yes. some, some time. <laughs> I think so. I think, I think that they enjoyed that. It was, <laughs> it was entirely strange, I think, maybe the, the whole time. But I got to be friends with... Um, and study with Jory Graham, and that was really fabulous. What was, um, were you, I've known a lot of, a number of lawyers, and a lot of them had a, an early wish to be a writer, or they consider their work a form of writing, and it is. Mm-hmm. Um, was the convergence between poetry and briefs something that was interesting to you, or was it completely separate in your mind? Uh, writing any, any kind, doing any kind of legal writing was very painful. Nice. Um, and, uh, it, it never stopped being painful um, because, you know, I, I, I had one way of thinking about writing that I had trained myself to do um, fairly intensely and legal writing is pretty different. And I, I don't think I ever really got it right. I ended up being a writing tutor for mm-hmm. uh, law students, but I never really got, it never really was natural to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so it, it never felt like a form of writing, even though I guess that's what I was doing. Um, it just felt like a, a thing I had to do to get the degree. Was it, um, did you have some idea, let's say, of Wallace Stevens selling insurance, um, that this was a way to support your poetry? Or I thought about that uh, briefly, um, but it turned out that um, the only kind of job that I could get that would pay back all the loans that I had would be a corporate job, and I did that for a few months, and I couldn't stand the idea of um, defending corporations against people who were much more like me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just I ended up that I couldn't do it, and I worked for, um, after that, I worked for Walmart for a while, and temp agencies, and at a factory, and stuff like that for a few years, or not a few years, for like maybe two, I guess it's a few. And then I ended up actually answering phones at law firms. And you were writing the whole time? Yeah. And yeah. what what sustenance were you finding in other poets? What poets other than Sylvia Plath were you reading? Um, what was I? Well, you know, um, I always really liked um, Renaissance poets mm. an awful lot. Um, and I had a special spot in my heart for Walter Raleigh. And I realize now that the reason I liked Walter Raleigh is because he wasn't the Renaissance poet other people read. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do love that work. Um, what, what spoke to you about it? You know, I think I liked, um, in some ways, it was as basic as enjoying the complications of uh, the syntax. I liked the way that um, the poets wrote their minds working through problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it ended up that I liked a lot of the metaphysical poets. Um, I, I just liked the complexity of it, um, and I liked the music of a lot of that work. Mm. I, it's, it's very interesting to, to look at your poems on the page and to see spaces and pauses between words. Um, and they're often pauses between ideas and one of the things that we've been talking about this evening is diversification and sort of being oneself and then plodding along and becoming someone else. Mm-hmm. Um, what I love so much in the Gilded Auction Block is how um, the onerous of being is no longer on you, it's on the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and the country as a body and a particular kind of political body. So I was wondering if you would, wouldn't share um, one of the first poems from the book to give us a sense of that voice? Sure. Okay. Um, I always have to make a decision about whether I'm going to use my reading glasses, and, I, and I'm going to. It looks good. Yeah, you know, I love them. Yeah. I, it's mostly <laughs> just so that I can open up the glasses case. <laughs> yes. um, all right, so let me take out my coffee stirrer. Um, 
So this is uh, The President Visits the Storm, and it has an epigraph, um, which is, what a crowd, what a turnout, which is what Donald Trump said when he visited victims of Hurricane Harvey. America, you're what a turnout, great crowd, a great crowd, big smiles, America. The hurricane is everywhere, but here an important man is talking here. America, the important president, is talking. And if the heavens open up, the heavens open above the president, the heavens open to assume him bodily into heaven, as they have opened to assume great men who will come back and bring the end with them. America, he trumpets the end of your suffering, both swan and horseman trumpeting from the back of the beast. The fire and rose are one on the president's bright head. The flames implanted to make a gilded crown. America, the hurricane is everywhere but here. America, a great man is a poison that kills the sky, the weather in the sky. For who, America, can look above him? You're what a great, a crowd, big smiles, the ratings. The body of a storm is a man's body. It has an eye, and everything in the eye is dead. A calm man is a man who has let weakness overcome his urge for death. America, the president, is talking. You're what a great, a turnout. You could be anywhere, but your anywhere is here. And every inch of the stadium, except those feet occupied by the stage, after his speech will be used to shelter those displaced by the storm, except those feet occupied by the their armed folks, police assigned to guard the stage, which must remain in place for the duration of the hurricane, except those feet of dead, unmarked space, called the safety zone between those officers and you. You must not violate the safety zone. You must not leave the safety zone. The president suggests you find the edge. It's at a common sense distance. It is farther than you can throw a rock, no farther than a bullet flies. Mm -mm. Yes. Thank you. Um, one of the things that is so profound about these um, poems, um, reading about your history, um, is often I think that we can, as writers, we, we claim the things that we lose um, through writing and through memory. And I thought of your father mm -hmm. often um, while I was reading some of these poems, and it was a way of getting back to that body, um, too. and. Another thing that was sort of astonishing to me um, was how you use the information of the world to make a poem. It's often very difficult to do that without seeming didactic mm -hmm. um, or ideological. Um, Marion Moore and Auden, two of my favorite poets, often disowned the poems that they wrote um, in opposition to um, a problem. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing for you to disown here, but I'm wondering what is what is it that you do in terms of process when you're reading the paper or listening to the news? What is it that you're absorbing or what gets through? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, the, 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 the problem that you're pointing at is um, a thing that I worried about a lot, or at least I worry about it in a sort of abstract way. Um, but I find that when I'm writing poems that have to do with particular things in the world, it's really no different from writing any other kind of poem. Um, I try to approach the poem um, in the midst of not knowing anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the problem with a lot of uh, political poems can be that they're written from a position where the speaker knows what they want to say, they know what the conclusion is, and they're just figuring out how to say it. And I usually don't know, I definitely don't know what I want to say, and I don't know how it's going to end. Mm -hmm. um, I have particular beliefs, and I've always felt that those would come out while I was writing, and it's simply that the subject I choose to think about through writing in those particular poems happens to be something that's going on right now um, in the world outside me, um, having to do with something political. Um, and so 
I, I think I take in news the same as anybody else, but um, when I uh, am going to use it in a poem, there's a way in which I try to unknow it as best I can. Mm. Is that something that you um, teach your students to be open to the possibility of chance and not knowing? You know, uh, when it comes up, yeah. Mm. Um, I find that <clears throat> generally um, they have a pretty good handle on it, at least with the the, the lyrics that they're often writing um, uh, in grad school. Often enough, I'm encountering poems that um, are not, they're very political, but they come at it at an angle, which allows them, the poets, I think, room to still be thinking, mm. um, as opposed to sort of just like, here's a poem about Jeff Sessions or whatever. Mm -hmm. I love that um, I'm very jealous of poets because unlike nonfiction, you don't have to prove that it's true or not. Mm. Um, that the ethos of a poem is the truth of the experience um, that the poet is having. That's nice. And so, um, thank you. And um, <laughs> um, one of the things I loved about, um, I'm being very greedy about your voice tonight, about something like, if you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. um, the next poem I'd love you to read um, gives us that information, mm -hmm. again, without it sort of leaving an ax in the back of our neck. Um, it's an undoing and a making at the same time. Would you mind reading it? Yeah, of course. Yeah, the undoing and the making, that's, a, that's what I'm going for. Mm. Um, so, uh, as you said, this is, if you see something, say something. And again, it has uh, a Donald Trump epigraph. This is a <laughs> he's, this he's is, getting a lot of press he in your is. book. This one is uh, fragmentary. It's just uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, an extraordinarily low IQ person. Mm. America, I dreamed, I looked at Auntie Maxine and knew from looking what she was, how smart she was and also her whole family, what they were and what they could be, is you my dream coming true, America? No dream I've dreamed of you would come true good, though I have dreamed as good as you, and you have often, you have often told me, dreamed the best dream, for at least for almost one third of the declining years of your short life, you've often dreamed the best for me and mine, and I have seen your best and dreamed it often good. Still in my dreams, I see instead through the eyes you've placed in the back of my head. Oh. Thank you. If not too, un too difficult, um, Shane, has your family read your work? Have they lived long enough to read your poetry? I don't know. Um, I don't know whether my grandfather has. I haven't spoken to him in, uh, I don't know, 26, 27, 28 years. Mm -hmm. um, my grandmother is dead. My mother has. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think my father has. And are you in touch with your parents at all? Or? Yeah. And yeah. What, is the, what kind of conversations do you have? With them about the current state of affairs? Oh, um, none. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't talk. I mean, I, I think that they, we are generally in the same area politically, but uh, we just don't talk about that stuff. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's go back to your teaching, because I know that you're much beloved. Um, <laughs> we're at the same school, so I, yeah. <laughs> I hear it. Um, um, this idea of teaching, I feel, is sometimes going back to the person that we were mm -hmm. um, and what we wish we'd had at that age. Um, are you teaching formal things like Sistina, how to write a Sistina or Villanelle or Sonnet, or is that, is that sort of outmoded in today's um, education about poetry? I mean, it's... I'm curious about it just because I want to take your class. <laughs> I mean, I have really complicated feelings about it because I only write metrical poetry. I, that was one of the ways I figured out how to be a, a maybe okay poet was to stop writing free verse. And that was just what it was for me. It's different for everybody, but that's what I needed. Um, Can you and, describe, talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, the shorthand version of it was that, you know, I went to Harvard. I wanted to take Joy Graham's workshop. I sat in on the class... 
um, I, I shared some of my poems with Jory and some of the students. One of the students was um, Garth Greenwell, who's a, mm-hmm. he's a fiction writer, yes. but he's also a wonderful poet, and that was primarily what he was doing back then. And Garth and I became uh, friends. Garth was kind enough to tell me that my poems were very bad, which mm-hmm. was true, but I couldn't do anything about it, really, until I kind of heard it from him. Um, and then I decided to you abandon... Sometimes you can't... Yeah. Be who you are w- without somebody telling you. Yeah, I really needed... Mm. I, I just needed a You push. needed negative reinforcement. I needed negative reinforcement because I wasn't mm. happy with the poems I was writing. No. Um, you, but knew in, you knew in your bones. Yeah, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't enjoy it, but it was the only way I knew how to do it. And so I just... When he said they were bad, I kind of just stopped everything that I had been doing. I stopped writing free verse. I stopped using punctuation. I made my poems double-spaced. I changed my syntax. And I did this basically immediately. I did it all at once. Mm. Um, I just reversed the way I had been writing, and it turned out that this new way was much more natural for me. Mm. I could write, you know, at any time, I could write two or three poems a day. You know, as long as I had time to do it, I could write as many as I wanted. Um, And it has never stopped feeling natural and easy and comfortable um, to write metrically, as opposed to when I was writing free verse poems, it was always a strain. I felt like I, I don't know, I was like trudging through something to get through a poem mm. and I couldn't write nearly as much. It was lucky if I got a poem a week, uh, it, it, that, w- that would be an amazing week. And so the switch to more constraints made writing much easier for me. Um, but I don't usually teach that in class. I mean, it depends. I, I, I like to give students a sense at least of how to do meter. And mm-hmm. I find that students are very curious about it um, because it's, it's most of poetry in English is metrical mm-hmm. because there were you know hundreds of years of that. Um, but you find that students today don't know how to read meter, they don't know how to write it, they don't know how to hear it. Mm-hmm. And so I think that there's a certain degree of like I'm supposedly becoming an expert in this art and yet a huge chunk of it, the majority of it, I don't understand. Yes. So you know, I think that they feel that, I felt that. Um, and so they like to learn about it, but usually in my workshops, um, we just talk about uh, their poems, where they're coming from. Mm-hmm. And if they're coming from writing meter, then I, I, I try to talk about it metrically. And if they're not, then I don't. Um, in my seminars, I, I talk about it a bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember once um, asking Derek Walcott about free first, and he just sort of erupted and he said, What's free about it? Yeah. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't encourage you to be free in your mind. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think maybe one of the things that um, is difficult about free verse is that it becomes narrative almost immediately. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like trying to write a short story a week. Um, Sure. And I think that um, the value of the lines that you're giving us as a poet are so um, powerful because of the consideration and between, um, and the convergence between biography world news, um, philosophy. So um, not to set you up too much, but would you mind reading something, um, the last poem that really speaks to me about all three of your concerns? Sure. Um, So I'm going to read the beginning of uh, section 2A, because I got really fancy and I had (laughs) uh, 2A and 2B and so forth, of this long long poem um, called The Hell Poem. And it's, um, it actually is, a, uh, it is a, a narrative poem, which was a, a thing for me. I'll just read the first part, um, where the speaker is describing falling into hell. And it's uh, the first section, 2A, it's called The Fall uh, slash The Tyrant Beetle at the Banks of the Living River of the Dead. And were I to read on, you would discover that that beetle is actually Donald Trump. <clears throat> so, I fell a whole... Lifetime of falling as I fell. And as I fell, I fell through my life. I watched my life projected on the walls of the hole. I fell through, but projected through. No lens, no carried by no light. No, but projected. Like a movie on the walls of the hole, I fell through, but backward like watching was like watching a movie from behind the screen. In kind of it was in black and white, but in super-saturated whites. 
and blacks like scraps of carbon paper, their edges spilling over the edges of the darknesses in the world. The blacks and whites overflowed the objects they belonged to, the objects I had thought belonged to them. And as I watched falling, the camera overflowed the edges of my memories once and again and then again to follow people I had hurt through selfishness, through inattention, from the edges of my memories into their memories and lives. I saw the harm I did. I saw eventually I, even my harm, disappeared. I disappeared. I had thought at least the scars I made would be the scars I made forever. I was a desk lamp next to shadows that would not be if it were not, and are its children and itself, and fade when sunlight fills the room. As I fell, slow through darkness, watching memories carried by no light. Mm. Thank you. I'm, I'm very um, covetous of your talent, and I would like to ask you one final thing. Would you ever consider venturing into the, um, crossing the thre threshold into the world of prose? I am trying to do that right now. Yay. I'm in the midst. I'm making the effort. I won't ask you what it is because it's unfair, but I'm very happy to hear it. Well, I'm happy you asked about it. <laughs> um, Shane, I want to thank you for coming thank you for out tonight me. for reading your exquisite work, and we look forward to many more things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so for the second portion of our program tonight, we have um, Michael R. Jackson. He's a young man I met through what I call critical fans, um, black gay men who don't, who don't let poor talent go without comment and great talents like Michael with something like fierce fraternity and praise. Um, this spring, his musical, A Strange Loop, is opening at Playwrights Horizon. The director is Stephen Brackett, and the story concerns, well, I'll let Michael tell it. Um, one thing to watch out for and listen for is um, the composer's interest in making a musical form that not only acknowledges the form, but tries to explode and reinvent it all at the same time. So please, let's welcome Michael R. Jackson. Cheers, is dangerous. Uh, <clears throat> um, I don't know anything about you. Good. Um, <laughs> because one of the great things about um, the people that you're working with, um, Blake, Blake and Stephen and the folks at Playwrights Horizons, is that they've been very protective about you um, and the genesis of this great thing that um, Brandon Jacob Jenkins was the first person to turn me on to on YouTube, mm -hmm. um, certain concert versions and songs and so on. So um, I'm very happy to have you as a captive audience <laughs> to ask you certain questions about where you're from and, and your interest in the musical form. Sure. So <laughs> that's a question, see? You're not used to it either. I'm not. Okay. okay. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm from Detroit, Michigan, originally. Mm -hmm. um, I born and raised in the city limits. I came to musical theater and theater in general. I always tell people that I learned about theater from going to church mm -hmm. because, like, nothing teaches you about like drama other than like like learning how to play for out of tune black people. Yeah. So like, <laughs> I like uh, my dad was a police a police lieutenant, and he 
uh, had an officer who was underneath him, and he had done her he had done he had done her some sort of favor, and and he to pay him back offered to give me and my brother piano lessons. So mm-hmm. is it just I, the two of you? T- yeah, just me and, and my older brother, and mm-hmm. we took piano lessons, and so I learned primarily how to play piano by ear first. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of years later, I started taking classical piano for a couple of years, although I didn't really excel at that. But um, in the meanwhile, like I like, because I was taking piano lessons, I was um, playing for the choirs and that sort of thing. And a lot of that just consisted of doing a lot of improvisation. Mm -hmm. And sort of during that period, like I learned that like I had perfect pitch and like, I had a real facility for music, mm-hmm. um, even though I wasn't particularly studied in it. Mm-hmm. And so I spent a lot of time improvising for choir, going home and just sort of making up little tunes for myself. But the thing that I didn't know how to do at that time was write lyrics, mm-hmm. because I thought lyrics were just poems. And mm-hmm. I later learned that they aren't. And so like I would try to just like write poems and then set them to music, mm-hmm. but it never really worked out. So I just figured, oh, I can't write songs, but I still kept like, improvising little tunes. I remember there's a wonderful story of um, Bjork ha- has lots of poet friends in Iceland, and so someone wrote her a poem, and she read it. She said, I can't sing this. There were too many <laughs> words. You were, so right. you were writing too many words. Yeah, and like I didn't have a sense. I didn't understand song form. Like I didn't even understand that like a verse be, yeah. from a chorus mm-hmm. or like A-A-B-A or like or how a song should build or that like lyrics are really about taking big ideas and pushing them down into like a small container. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until I went to grad school to the graduate musical theater writing program at NYU that I learned about song form because I went into the program only as a words person initially, as a book writer. Oh, so I, is that true? Yes, because I studied playwriting in, as an undergrad at NYU in the dramatic writing program, which I always call those the lost years. <laughs> so like, um, <laughs> all shade. Uh-huh. Um, so like, I um, so I went into the program to the grad music for the writing program, and like, uh, the way that program worked was that. You, they sort of evaluated your writing ability and they teach you how to write lyrics if you're a words person. And that just ended up being like a really great container for writing I had been doing since middle school. And um, and once I learned how to write lyrics, at the end of the first year, we had a, a special class with um, Mike Reed who wrote that song, I Can't Make You Love Me. Um, he was- I don't the, know, what is oh, it? Oh, that Bonnie Raitt song. Oh, oh, I can't turn down the light. Yes, yes. You know, yes. that bop. So then yes. um, he said, hey, if you're a lyricist who's never written music before and you want to try it, go for it. And then if you're a uh, composer who's never written lyrics, vice versa. So I decided, since I now had a sense of song form lyrically, the musical ideas that I sort of had had the whole time had somewhere to go. Mm-hmm. So I decided to try my hand at writing a song for that class. And the song I wrote was a song called Memory Song, which I'll do for you later, mm-hmm. which is in a, uh, my musical Strange Loop. Although at that time, it was just a standalone song, just as a, a an experiment for class. And I played it in class, and it went over really well. And I was encouraged to continue writing music, even though for my thesis project, I was going to be paired with a composer collaborator. Mm -hmm. And so I just was writing songs on the side while working on my thesis project with my collaborator, Rachel. Um, And then I just kept writing music and kept writing music. And then gradually over time, I would share with people. And then people came to know me as a composer, even though I don't have a composition degree or background. I have a BFA in playwriting, and I came to New York thinking I was going to write for soap operas. So <laughs> that was like my dream when I came to New York. I wanted oh. to be the head writer of One Life to Live. So um, we were we were cook- <laughs> we were cooking up a new we were cooking up a new show for Michael Beck yeah. stage, and I think he should do Wendy Williams the opera in a heartbeat. Yeah, in a heartbeat. Yeah. I would tear that shit up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to rewind and go back to the lost years because mm-hmm. they're always so interesting. Right. Um, what what do you mean by the lost years that you came to New York to be a playwright? No, I came to New York to write for be the head writer of One Life to, to Live. live. <laughs> ah, so school was just a diversion. Yeah, it was just something I to see. do. I wanted to get away from my my first well, let me well, order. I wanted to get Detroit. away from my parents. Mm. That was goal number one. Get away from Detroit, get away from my parents, mm-hmm. go to New York. Goal number two, become the head writer of One Life to Live. Right. And then who the fuck cares what happened after that? Now, were you <laughs> seeing theater in Detroit or were you just watching One Life to Live? 
No, so I wasn't watching Life to Live and really until right before I came to New York. Before I was watching Another World, but that got canceled. So I started watching One Life to Live because Another One Life to because Another World had gotten canceled. But I was going to see theater. My mother and I used to always she used to take me to see musicals all the time, and mm-hmm. so I had a, a love of musicals even though I never, I didn't intend to write them because I just, I had no, I didn't really understand that musicals were even written. I thought like movies, they were sprung out of the ground. The mm-hmm. only thing I understood that was made was television shows. Yes. I understood that like people wrote television shows, but movies and musicals, they just like, it brought it out of the earth. Were you, so were you listening to things in your room? What were you listening yeah, to? Yeah, so like my, I remember uh, when I was in seventh grade, there was a, the... I, the tour of uh, the Hal Prince tour. I can't believe I now know someone who remembers the seventh grade. Yes. <laughs> so um, uh, Good. Well, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm a zennial. Yes. I'm in between. Anyway, yes. um, I'm not, there was a t- the national tour of Showboat was happening, the Hal Prince revival in 94. Mm, with and, Elaine Stritch. Yes, although the touring version had... Um, Cloris Leachman. Okay. And so I, she was great. Yeah. So like we went to Toronto and we saw Showboat and we saw Phantom of the Opera, me and my mom and my grandmother. And like, I did not understand Phantom of the Opera at all. I remember sitting there and being like, I don't, no, I, I don't understand what's happening on the stage. Right. But I like, like the sound of it, but I didn't dramatically, it didn't compute to me. And so I made my mom buy me the cast album for it. And, and I, I liked listening to it. But then when we saw Showboat, I like lost my mind. I like was so enraptured by it as like a 12 or 13 year old. And like, I know it, I know every song from it backwards and forwards. And so then from there, like I, we saw like Miss Saigon came to Detroit and we saw um, a real favorite of mine was Raisin, the musical mm-hmm. adaptation of Raisin right. of the Sun. It is one of the best musicals ever. And people don't know it because um, there's like rights issues and you can't do a first class production of it, but it has some of the most incredible songwriting you will ever hear ever it won the tony for best musical in 1974 um and there's this one song and it called not anymore which is like this really brilliant song about covert liberal white liberal covert racism Mm -hmm. that i used to put on repeat i was like this is my jam when i was like 14 and i would put it on repeat and listen to it over and over again and it's actually one of those songs that actually had a big influence on me because it taught me a lot about irony, which is something that I use a lot of in my own work. Mm -hmm. Um, Although at the time I didn't realize how much of an influence it was on me. But like if you, if you like track my later work to today, you can actually sort of see how I, that, that song and that show planted certain seeds for me for the kind of work that I wanted to be making. Were you listening to any pop music at all? Oh yeah, yeah. So I went from, my, the first album I ever owned <laughs> I when just, I was 13 years old was Mariah Carey Music Box. Uh-huh. And then I became gay and then <laughs> um, and angsty. And I like my cousin had gone to Interlochen and got kicked out. And she brought me back all these white girls. So I she brought me Tori Amos's album Under the Pink. And that was like exactly the right time when I was like rebelling against like blackness and mm-hmm. sex and straightness. And so I would put on Under the Pink, Under the Covers at, at night with my headphones on and I would listen to that album and that like was like my gateway drug into like being like a rebellious sort of writer. Like Tori Amos like is a huge, huge yes. influence on me. Yes. So uh, so that was, that was, it was like that and then like I found Joni Mitchell and like that was like my lane and Jewel. I used to wash the dishes and sing, you know, like pieces of you while I was washing the dishes. <laughs> and like Alanis Morissette. And that all, like I was like hugely into the white girls. But like before all of that, like it was like my parents' music, which is also influenced on me. So like all the Motown mm-hmm. stuff, the sort of sound of Philadelphia, uh, any sort of soul music. Roberta. Roberta Flack, yes. Luther, you know, um, degree, uh, uh, Temptations, Four Tops, Dion Warwick, like all yes. three degrees. Oh my yes. God, to three degrees. Fuck yes. the Supremes, to three That's degrees right. all day, every That's day. Right. Yeah. Um, so that was like all of that stuff was like a big influence on me. Billy Joel, El- like Elton John, Linda Ronstadt, like just any that 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 whole thing. Because I was of also listening to the it was radio, all story, but it was all storytelling. Yeah, it was storytelling, mm-hmm. and like and also just musically, a lot of these people were taking a lot of risks in what they in the sounds they were creating and the sonic sort of uh, palettes that they were pulling from and and that all like hit my ear in a really great way and it, I felt their challenge to try to write music that was as sort of 
inventive as theirs, at least in my mind, as mm -hmm. a kid and into like a young adult who was starting to write musical theater. And so you had, um, back to the lost years, that there was um, this moment when you were at NYU, I mean, waiting to get right. your job on television. Right. Um, you were studying. Mm -hmm. um, and, and learning about plays. So the like, playwriting I didn't know anything about. And mm -hmm. I didn't go well, to How did you get plays. into the school? So the way that program worked at the time, I don't know if it's like that anymore, is that they sort of submit a general writing sample. So I, I submitted like fiction and poetry that I had written in high school. And then when you get into the program, they sort of start everybody on the same level. And then you either sort of facilitate, uh, end up vacillating toward playwriting or screenwriting or television writing. And I just sort of fell into playwriting, even though I still wanted to be the head writer and wanted to live. So, mm. um, and I started seeing more and more plays because they would always get us tickets to things. And mm. like, I just sort of fell in love with um, stage plays and theater in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, even though, you know, in addition to musical theater. And you said that um, you started working on some of the songs for Strange Loop as and it's a side project from your thesis? No, well, kind of. It was, mm -hmm. what happened was that was once I went to grad school mm -hmm. because the initial seed for A Strange Loop actually started as a monologue that I wrote right after I graduated from NYU undergrad. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to grad school and then wrote that first song, Memory Song, then I started writing other songs that weren't necessarily for A Strange Loop because the, the concept of A Strange Loop didn't exist. It's just the, the template for the sort of seed for what it would become did. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't intending to write a musical. I just was like, I wrote this monologue, I wrote these songs, and then I started trying to put the songs in a monologue together, and then that suggested something. And then over time, as I started working with various directors on it, it started to evolve into the thing that is now A Strange Loop. Tell us a little bit um, about the story of A Strange Loop before I make you get up and play something beautiful from it. Yeah, so A Strange <laughs> Loop is an, uh, what I call a self-referential musical, not autobiographical, um, about a black gay musical theater writer who works as an usher at a Broadway show who is writing a musical about a black gay musical theater writer who works as an usher at a Broadway show who is writing a musical about a black gay musical theater writer who works as an usher at a Broadway show and sort of cycling through his self-hatred. Mm -hmm. um, but where does the self hatred come from? Oh, it comes from like family. Uh, uh, family. It comes from sort of like uh, what he calls the gay triarchy. Mm -hmm. It comes from just the world in general. And like he's somebody who's like really sort of trying to excavate his own soul and his experience of what it means to be a self. Mm -hmm. And that self is obviously a black queer self. So um, that's like his journey as he's writing this musical within a musical within a musical. Does he find love at the end? Does he find love at the end? Yeah. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, well, self-love, for yeah. sure. Is that what you meant? Or do you mean, like, um, love with a man? I'll take it any way I can get it. He's not going to get <laughs> love with a man. He doesn't need a man. He nice. needs himself. Who is a man. Who is a man. So he gets, he does find love at the end yes. with a man. Um, would, you, would, you mind, would you mind sharing of course. with us? Sorry, oh. sorry. The chair is the chair is dangerous. Sneaking a cupcake These are my memories These are my memories Shooting hoops off the rim Slow on the uptake These are my memories These are my memories After gym, the locker room My eyes photographing Naked me measures in at four and a half inches These are my memories These are my memories Of one lone black gay boy I knew who chose to turn his back on the Lord one lone black gay boy I knew who chose to turn his back on the Lord. Guilt and shame, Jesus' name, church every Sunday. These are my memories, these are my memories. Eat his body, drink his blood, communion buffet. These are my memories, sweet sour memories. After church, we're driving home to Radio Crackle. Jazz me, Zach, or Motown Blues, and skin is a shackle. For one lone black gay boy I knew who chose to turn his back on the Lord. One lone black gay boy I knew who chose to turn his back on the Lord. These are 
my memories, sweet sour memories. This is my history, this is my mystery. Mom is napping on the couch and dad cuts the grass while I watch TV all day long, young and the restless. Like one little black gay boy I knew who chose to turn his back on the Lord. One lone black gay boy I knew who chose to turn his back on the Lord. Dad is drunk and on the couch and mom eats a pork chop. Daily bread mill, daily treadmill won't ever stop. One lone black gay boy I knew who chose to turn his back on the Lord. One lone black gay boy I knew who chose to turn his back on the Lord. I am lying on the couch, I dream that I'm flying, flapping both my wings so hard to keep me from dying, with a crown of godforsaken thorns on my head. Like all those black gay boys I knew who chose to go on back to the Lord. All those black gay boys I knew who chose to go on back to the Lord. Those black gay boys I knew who chose to go on back to the Lord. And one lone black gay boy I knew who chose to turn his back on the Lord. Instead. Thank you. Thank it's you. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I was always amazed by um, at parties, let's say, George George Wolf gives parties or Christmas parties, and there would often be among the actors and producers and writers of color um, discussions about how segregated um, the musical comedy or musical drama world was. Um, and I was wondering, when you were putting this show together and selling it, um, what were you experiencing going to producers' homes, or um, what was it like to go out there and sing these songs that had never really been heard before about a subject matter that had not been written about musically before? So it's really, actually, sorry. It's really interesting because I, I didn't really do that. I mean, not in the traditional sense, because mm -hmm. what happened was, so I started, I wrote memory song, and then that was just like a song. And then I had, and then I wrote some other songs, and then I started trying to put them with this old monologue that I had written. And then like the, a show sort of started trying to be suggested, and then a strange loop sort of came out of that. But then I also was ushering at the Lion King on Broadway, um, and so that put me right at broad, like right in Broadway's face. Mm -hmm. And when I saw Broadway's face, I said, oh, this musical will never be produced. Mm -hmm. And I like was like totally okay with that because I was like, oh, I don't do, I don't do that. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, so I'll just write this musical the way that I want to write it. And it'll just be like a fun hobby for me mm -hmm. to do while that, that'll never be produced. That I was like, again, like I'd had no ambitions for, about it whatsoever. So I just kept working on it and working on it. And then the funny thing was that it, I kept getting little opportunities to work on it in places that weren't necessarily, um, they weren't producers' houses. They were places like um, the playwrights' realm when it was first starting. Mm -hmm. Like we did a developmental piece there. And then um, I did a little reading at the Lark. Mm -hmm. um, play Development Center, and then I did. I got. I uh, I asked my uh, director Stephen Brackett if he would direct a reading of the piece at NYU just for me to see it. And then it was at that point. Prior to that point, the piece had was cast across race and gender, and he mm -hmm. was the one who suggested, "What if we did this musical all with all black and queer identified people?" And once he suggested that, that sort of opened up a door 
into what the piece could be. And so I started writing toward that concept. Mm -hmm. And then like I put the piece away for a couple of years and then Shakina Nathak, who was the founding artistic director of the Musical Theater Factory approached me and said, hey, I'm starting this thing, this, uh, this uh, sort of musical developmental hub. Do you have anything you want to work on? And said, hey, I've had this musical I've been working on, on and off for a couple of years. And I brought it into the first writer's group there. And then from there, she said, I think you need to do a residency of it. And then I did like a residency of it well, a reading of it. And then from there, like p people started to sort of take notice mm -hmm. of it and me. And then like a couple years after that, I went to the Johnny Mercer writing colony at Goodspeed and mm -hmm. I did a little piece of it there. And then from there, they invited me to do an excerpt of it at 54 Below. And then from there, um, Kent Nicholson at Playwrights Horizons was sort of interested in it, and then, but he was waiting for it to be more polished. And then from there, Jennifer Ashley Tepper at 54 Below, um, they did a subsidized concert version of it, which mm. was sort of the real game changer. And then from there, um, Michael Walkup at Page 73 became interested in sort of helping develop it. And then, then we did a workshop of it at Playwrights Horizons. Mm. And then from there, I got another producer, this woman named Barbara Whitman, wanted to come and help the piece. And then from there, we did an industry reading. And then from there, Playwrights Horizons <laughs> decided to do it. So like, it, so so, like, so so it the was, experience of it- It was protected by Yeah, it was interest. very protected mm -hmm. all the, pretty much the whole way around. And I was, so, and I was able to develop it with the way, exactly the way I wanted to mm -hmm. write it. I mean, like we were developing, we were, I was getting dramaturgical notes and that sort of thing, but it wasn't like, it, I wasn't like Jonathan Larson, where mm -hmm. like, you know, I had this musical and I did everything that I could do to like, and I banged down doors and I like, you know, you know, pound at 42nd Street trying to get <laughs> it to be in a show, you know, like, cause I was just like, this is like a black queer, like musical that's like very, you know, raw and funny and like, you know, about something very delicate and I was like no one's gonna like I, I just I didn't have any illusions about it being mm -hmm. like on Broadway or anything so but like I was I feel very fortunate that I was able to protect it in that way and stick to like my intent mm -hmm. and that eventually sort of the industry came to me um, right because it, it could be an organic project yeah that was projected as opposed protect I'm sorry protected as opposed to being put on the industry, the right. industry came to it. Yeah, yeah. How were you supporting yourself during all that time? Okay, so <laughs> I started off temping, and then I also got like this writing gig on this like horrible musical that like I wasted five years of my life on, but it was like a paid gig. Then what I were you doing on the musical? I was writing lyrics for this. I shouldn't even talk about it, but like okay. it like. I, I got paid like a fair amount of money to do it, but and it was like my first writing job out of grad school, and I thought, oh, I can just someone like wants me to write a musical about something they want me to write a musical about, and I just came out of school where we had to do that all the time, and I just thought, oh, I can just like write it, just from a functional place. But the thing that I learned from that was that you actually musicals are so hard and so difficult to do that like you have to really be invested in them mm -hmm. and like and for me I'm not someone who can just write for hire and do everything like I have to be able to bring a point of view to it and so I ended up having to beg my way off that project and then so that led me to temping I deliver cookies I um I oh I ushered I was uh, for summer a horrible summer I street teamed for the Broadway show Rock of Ages on that that mm -hmm. like triangle, triangle. at TKTS. Mm -hmm. And it was like so horrifying. It was like one of the most horrifying summers of my life. And then after that, I got what I thought was an amazing clerical job in the finance department at an advertising agency. <laughs> and then that was like the seventh circle of hell, which I also <laughs> lost five years of my life to. And then after, and I ran screening from there to be an executive <laughs> assistant at a nonprofit. And then that was like a deeper circle of hell. <laughs> And then fortunately after that, I um, won the Jonathan Larson Award. I've, I've won a bunch of awards that sort of enabled me to sort of like step out on faith. Although that was difficult because then like those, like I didn't, I squandered all the money. And then like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like borrowing money from everyone, maxing out all the credit cards and then like some other things came through. And so Oof. 
it's been like I'm meeting with a financial advisor next month to like <laughs> help me <laughs> help me like be wiser about like the fact that I'm a working class freelance artist in America and nobody cares about us. So yes. um, so that's how I supported myself by not by like making unwise choices and <laughs> and then trying to do better. Does your um, protagonist in Strange Loop make those? make those mistakes as well? No, th he doesn't get that far. Okay. <laughs> he's like, this. that's like the first, like he's in a, a, the first half of his journey. If I wrote like two sequels, then there, we would see the other half. Would you mind sharing, um, in conclusion, two songs? For sure. That you um, think are indicative of what you're trying to do in the show? For sure. So I'm going to play the next one, and the one after that, um, I'm going to have Carl St. Lucie is going to play for me. Okay. Uh, so thank you. I don't have AIDS and I don't care about marriage And I will never be pushing a loud ass baby around in a carriage No, I'll just walk around with a scowl on my face like I'm Betty Friedan Because the second wave feminist in me is at war with this dick sucking black gay man Who's not looking for now as much as 15 years later and so the grinder crowd turns me into a chronic stay-at-home masturbator when I want to go out on a Saturday night I don't feel that I can because the second wave feminist in me is at war with the dick sucking black gay man so I fall outside of the norm Cause I burn my bra to keep warm While most of my brethren swarm To Beyonce and Rihanna And bareback and felching and so on But they won't get AIDS Cause now they're taking Truvada and I don't know what to say, so I stay in my corner and I just say nada And watch them all do what they want without fear and without having a plan Meanwhile the second wave feminist in me is at war with the dick sucking black gay man So nobody comes on my chest and I come off sounding repressed But maybe that's all for the best If I want something deeper And someone who thinks I'm a keeper And who can understand My long hesitation and who will take my hand and help me undo this polarization and lets me curl up with Charlene, Mary Jo, Julia, and Suzanne until the second wave feminist in me ends the war with his dick sucking black gay man On 
days his blackness feels like another hurdle that won't get out of his way. His inner white girl starts kicking like a baby. She wants to come out and play. She doesn't care if she ruffles any feathers. In fact, that is her MO. Where he's the king of avoiding confrontation. There's not a bomb she won't throw. Because white girls can do anything, can't they? Black boys must always obey their mothers. White girls can do anything, can't they? Can't they? Can't they? Can't they? Some days he feels like his blackness is a treasure that's under constant attack. His inner white girl protects it from the rotters. She always takes up the slack. She lets him feel like a human supernova, like he can conquer the earth. Like he's the heir to the power and oppression, her kind of wielded since birth. Because white girls can do anything, can't they? Black boys must always obey their mothers. White girls can do anything, can't they? Can't they? Can't they? Can't they? They They get to be cool, tall, vulnerable, and luscious. They get to be wild and unwise. They get to be shy and introspective. They get to make noise, they get to mesmerize. Black boys don't get to be cool, tall, vulnerable, and luscious. Don't get to be wild and unwise. Don't get to be shy and introspective. Don't get to make noise, don't get to fantasize. doesn't look blue in any moonlight which makes him harder to see that's why he clings to his silly inner white girl the same one clinging to me we want to be free we want to belong we want either love or validation but neither can easily so her siren song keeps us in total subjugation we want to be cool, tall, vulnerable, and luscious. We want to be wild and unwise. We want to be shy and introspective. We want to make noise, we want to mesmerize. Why can't we be cool, tall, vulnerable, and luscious? Why can't we express in our own way? Why can't we unleash what's locked inside us? Who made up these rules? Black boys all have to obey.